As American Presbyterians faced the fundamentalist modernist controversy of the early 20th century, there was already a geographical division as well. The southern body, which left the northern Presbyterians in 1861, was the Presbyterian Church in the U.S. The northern Presbyterian group was the Presbyterian Church in the United States of America, or PCUSA. The flagship seminary of the denomination was Princeton Theological Seminary, which is the second oldest seminary in the United States. In the early 1920s, one new name in the PCUSA stood out as a strong defender of Presbyterian conservatism and the reliability of the Bible, J. Gresham Machen. He was the professor of New Testament at Princeton, and in 1921, he wrote The Origin of Paul's Religion, defending against accusation that Paul's Christianity was different from what Jesus had taught. In 1923, he wrote Christianity and Liberalism, an attack on the modernism which he wasn't just seeing in other denominations, but that he was engaged in a close-up war against. In fact, during the rest of the 1920s, a Cold War was taking place at Princeton. In 1910, 1916, and 1923, the General Assembly of the PCUSA had given as requirements for ordination the belief in the inerrancy of the scriptures, the virgin birth, and deity of Christ, substitutionary atonement, Christ's bodily resurrection, and the legitimacy of biblical miracles. 1,300 ministers in 1924 challenged this position. They signed a document that would be labeled as the Auburn Affirmation. One of the things stated in the Auburn Affirmation was a solid rejection of inerrancy. It said, There is no assertion in the scriptures that their writers were kept from error. The confession of faith does not make this assertion, and it is significant that this assertion is not to be found in the Apostles' Creed or the Nicene Creed or in any of the great Reformation confessions. The doctrine of inerrancy intended to enhance the authority of the scriptures, in fact, impairs their supreme authority for faith and life, and weakens the testimony of the church to the power of God unto salvation through Jesus Christ. Other contents of the affirmation challenged that the General Assembly should put any additional standards on ordination and that different theories on those named points were acceptable. Princeton's conservatives weren't in line with where the PCUSA was going, and as a result, efforts were put into place to make Princeton fit better with the liberalism that students and churches were beginning to expect. There effectively was a reorganization with boards being changed to take political and directional control away from Machen and those sympathetic to him. Two Auburn Affirmation signers were set up as trustees. In 1929, after 23 years as an esteemed Princeton scholar, Machen resigned and led in the establishment of Westminster Theological Seminary. In 1933, Machen, concerned with the liberalism tolerated among PCUSA missionaries, formed an independent missions board. The PCUSA said that this act was unconstitutional, and when Machen and other PCUSA ministers refused to resign from the board, a nationally reported on trial ensued. In 1935, Machen and the others were defrocked, and in June 1936, driven by his efforts especially, a new Presbyterian denomination was founded. 34 ministers, 17 ruling elders, and 79 laymen met together, and the name chosen was the Presbyterian Church of America. Because of the PCUSA's ownership of all church property, all of the congregations that left to form the PCA, except for one, lost their property. Machen would not live to see what became of this denomination as he died six months after its founding on January 1, 1937. Later in 1937, another denomination split from the PCA, the Bible Presbyterian Church, led by Carl McIntyre, which required premillennial eschatology and taught total abstinence from alcohol. In 1939, the Presbyterian Church in the United States of America threatened the Presbyterian Church of America with a lawsuit over the similarity of their name, and as a result, a special general assembly changed the name to Orthodox Presbyterian Church. Of this name, they say, Although claiming the name of Christianity, liberalism began by questioning the full authority of the Bible and ended up denying every biblical doctrine that modern secular thinking found disagreeable. The OPC was established in direct opposition to liberalism. The word orthodox in our name indicates that we are committed to straight doctrine, which lines up with God's word. The Orthodox Presbyterian Church is governed by three sets of documents, its primary, secondary, and tertiary standards. The word of God, the Bible, is the primary standard. The 
confessions of faith and catechisms are the secondary standard, and the standards of government, worship, and discipline are the tertiary standards. The OPC affirms one God and the doctrine of the Trinity, God in three persons. Jesus, who is divine, was born of a virgin and took a human nature. He lived a sinless life, died on a cross, rose from the dead, reigns in heaven, and will return. There's a future judgment resulting in eternal life for the saved and eternal punishment for the wicked. There are two sacraments, baptism and the Lord's Supper. Infants are baptized as soon as practicable. One parent should be a member of the church in good standing. In a Q&A on their website, the OPC responds to, May people join the OPC and not baptize their children with, Most Orthodox Presbyterian churches will have members who do not believe in infant baptism. It also clarifies that nobody in ordained office could refuse to have their children baptized, but that the matter of members doing so is left to the discretion of the local church's session. People already baptized in other denominations are not rebaptized. The baptismal theology of the church is expressed in the following words, suggested by the Directory for Public Worship. Baptism with water suggests and seals cleansing from sin by the blood and the Spirit of Christ, together with our death unto sin and our resurrection unto newness of life by virtue of the death and resurrection of Christ. The time of the outward application of the sign does not necessarily coincide with the inward work of the Holy Spirit, which the sign represents and seals to us. In our baptism, the Lord puts his name on us, claims us as his own, and summons us to assume the obligations of the covenant. He calls us to believe in Jesus Christ as our Savior, to renounce the devil, the world, and the flesh, and to walk humbly with our God in devotion to his commandments. Unbaptized adults who make profession of faith are also to be baptized. Churches have communicant members who are those who are baptized and have made profession of faith in Christ and have been given membership by the church session, and also non-communicant members who are the baptized children of communicant members. This profession of faith and acceptance into membership is not termed confirmation, though some elements of what other denominations may call confirmation are present. The Directory for Public Worship gives as example wording for the minister when the public profession of faith is made as follows. Beloved in the Lord Jesus Christ, we thank our God for the grace that was given you, and that you have accepted God's covenant promise that was signified and sealed unto you in your infancy by holy baptism. We ask you now to profess your faith publicly. This is followed by the minister asking several questions that must be answered in the affirmative. For the Lord's Supper, the element of the cup can be unfermented grape juice or fermented wine. The bread may be leavened or unleavened. Sacraments are to be administered only under the oversight of the government of the church. If a member in good standing is hospitalized or housebound due to illness or other incapacitating circumstances, the Lord's Supper can be administered outside a regular worship service. The Directory of Public Worship says that it ought to be celebrated frequently, but leaves it to the local church session to decide how frequently. The table is to be fenced, that is, the minister is to say words informing those present that not everyone is eligible to participate. The Directory of Public Worship gives example wording. If you are not trusting in Jesus Christ as your Savior, if you are not a member of a faithful Christian church, if you are not living penitently and seeking to walk in godliness before the Lord, then I warn you in the name of Christ not to approach the holy table of the Lord. As for the presence of Christ, a Q&A says, the Lord's Supper is more than a mere memorial, as some Protestants would have it. There is a real presence in its proper celebration, but it is not a bodily presence. It is a real spiritual presence of the Lord Jesus Christ with his people. The canon of Scripture, which is infallible and inerrant, is 39 books in the Old Testament and 27 in the New Testament, 66 in total. The Directory of Worship says that those reading God's Word in a public service should use an accurate, faithful translation in the language of the people. A Q&A says, We believe that the church is to be reformed by the Word of God, including dealing with the Bible as it deals with itself. If the Scripture depicts an event or person as a literal historical reality, we believe that it is indeed literal history. If a passage is figurative, we will try to understand the figure from the clearer passages. On creation, the OPC has disciplined those who taught human evolution produced Adam, but does not have a set position on the length of the days of creation. Some believe in literal 24-hour days, others hold to day-age or framework theories. A Q&A quotes the Westminster Confession and comments on it, This we believe as we read in the Westminster Confession of Faith, chapter 4, paragraph 1, It pleased God the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost for the manifestation of the glory of his eternal power, wisdom, Wisdom and goodness in the beginning to create or make of nothing the world and all things therein, whether visible or invisible, in the space of six days and all very good. In doing so, we reject the myth of evolution and all that it implies. This reflects the biblical teaching where God says to us in Hebrews 11:3, By faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that the things which are seen were not made of things which are visible. 
On Original Sin, a Q&A says, The Reformed view holds that the Bible teaches that all mankind is guilty of Adam's first sin, Romans 5, verse 14 through 21, that as a result of the curse, man's human nature is corrupt, original sin, that from this corruption comes forth man's actual sins in thought, word, and deed, and that as a result of God's curse upon Adam and his progeny, all mankind is dead, not just sick, in trespasses and sins. An OPC tract on salvation says in part, Justification in the Bible is not a process. It is an act of God which takes place the moment a man puts his faith in Jesus Christ. By it, a guilty sinner is viewed as though he had never sinned and is clothed with the perfect righteousness of Christ. God is just and the justifier of him that believeth in Jesus. Romans 3.25 Perhaps you have labored all your life in a search for forgiveness. Even now you are not sure of deliverance from hell, and the Bible has much to say about the certainty of hell. You may end your search here and now. God has sent forth his son as the savior. That means that he actually saves men by his death on the cross. Christ's death does not merely make salvation possible, leaving you to work out your share of the saving task. He did it all. He said it is finished. From the starting point of faith alone, we proceed to bear the fruit of faith in good works. Faith which does not produce works is a dead faith, to be sure. But here is the first step, justification by faith alone. Only faith in Christ and his death for sin and that faith alone can win full pardon for your sin. Are you trusting him as Savior? In a Q&A on decisional regeneration, Stephen Pribble's article, Do You Know the Truth About Being Born Again? is quoted positively. The quote states, There is a popular misconception that being born again results from a person's decision to invite Christ into his life. This view is widely held in Baptist, Nazarene, Wesleyan, Pentecostal, and independent churches. It is the view of most evangelists doing area-wide crusades. One such evangelist actually wrote a book entitled How to Be Born Again, as if the Holy Spirit needed instruction. This view may be designated decisional regeneration. It is demonstrably faulty for it contradicts the express teaching that being born again is not of the will of the flesh. See John 1 verses 12 through 13. What does this mean? The New International Version renders this not of human decision. John's point is that an individual by making a decision does not cause his own new birth. The OPC has a Calvinist salvation theology. The booklet What is the OPC says, Those whom God has predestined unto life are effectually drawn to Christ by the inner working of the Spirit as they hear the gospel. When they believe in Christ, God declares them righteous, justifies them, pardoning their sins and accepting them as righteous, not because of any righteousness of their own, but by imputing Christ's merits to them. The OPC lists the following as affirmed positions. Total depravity. Man in his natural state is dead in trespasses and sins. Unconditional election. God the Father has sovereignly chosen those who will be saved. Limited atonement. The Lord Jesus died for all whom the Father had given to him and for them only. Irresistible grace. The Holy Spirit sovereignly and effectually applies salvation to the elect. Perseverance of the saints. Those who are truly saved will never be lost. What is the OPC also says, the OPC, however, seeks to be biblically reformed and firmly rejects Arminianism. A Q&A says, a person who says, because I believe in Jesus, I can sin however I want and still go to heaven is reprobate and not converted, Jude 4. There is no eternal security for hypocrites. And also, the warning of scripture tells us that though we have been assured by the spirit of our salvation, we may not presume on that assurance in order to sin willfully. If we do so, we may find that we are among the self-deceived hypocrites. Rather, the scripture admonishes us to make our calling and election sure, 2 Peter 1.10, with preceding context, by being diligent to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. The warnings of scripture are not hypothetical. They are meant to be taken seriously. True saints will all persevere in the faith, John 8, 30 and 31, and then we will give thanks to God, not to ourselves, for preserving us by his grace. The OPC also says, the gospel is offered freely to the lost. Both Arminianism and hyper-Calvinism are rejected in this connection. On entire sanctification, a Q&A states, Wesleyans teach that individuals should seek a crisis experience, subsequent to conversion, in which they become entirely sanctified and never sin again. The only way that they can maintain such an illusion is to redefine sin as some kind of lapse which is not fundamentally displeasing to God. Over against this view, the Westminster Standards teach that sanctification is the work of God's free grace, whereby we are renewed in the whole man after the image of God, and are enabled more and more to die unto sin, 
sin and live unto righteousness. This sanctification is throughout in the whole man, yet imperfect in this life, there abiding still some remnants of corruption in every part, whence ariseth a continual and irreconcilable war, the flesh lusting against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. The truth is that the sincere Christian will struggle against sin all his life and will be entirely delivered only in death. On Pentecostalism or Charismatism, the OPC is cessationist and does not permit the claimed practice of miraculous spiritual gifts. In 1976, the OPC disciplined a pastor for privately speaking in tongues. Of this, a Q&A page says, Why our action in 1976? Because the special gifts listed in 1 Corinthians 12 were limited to the times of the apostles which ceased at the end of the apostolic age. Hebrews 2, 1 and 2 says, God has in these last days spoken to us in his Son. He is the living word, John 1, 1 and 14. It is noteworthy that after Jesus ascended, the apostles did the same miracles that Jesus did, e.g. Acts 3, verses 1 through 9 and 9, 33 through 42. These miracles in the name of Jesus demonstrated that the power of Christ was given to the apostles and to some not apostles on whom they laid their hands. But the main reason for the OPC's 1976 action was that 1 Corinthians 14 teaches that tongues could be interpreted by another special gift. So when genuine tongues were interpreted to the edifying of the church, they became prophecy. Now the New Testament brought to the final conclusion the revelations of God to his people throughout previous ages. With the death of the last apostle, there was no more prophecy, including tongues, which were prophecy in another language. We still get illumination from the Spirit through the Word, but no new revelations of the Spirit. On eschatology, the OPC rejects dispensationalism and a pre-tribulation rapture. They say, The thought of putting 1,007 years between the coming of Christ for his saints and his coming with them at the great white throne judgment at the end of the 1,000 year millennium doesn't accord with other scriptures. The dispensationalist premillennial view should be rejected because the Bible teaches that Christ's second coming, the resurrection of all the dead, and the final judgment will come at one time. A Q&A says, The Orthodox Presbyterian Church does not take an official position on any one millennial position and allows latitude to its ministers, officers, and members on the interpretation of such passages as Revelation 20, Matthew 24, etc. Within our church, there are those who hold to post-millennialism, amillennialism, and historic premillennialism. The only major millennial position that is not tolerated would be dispensational premillennialism. Another Q&A says that full preterism is also an unacceptable position. On Israel, a Q&A says, The nation of Israel as it existed as the people of God in the Old Testament is no more. Galatians 6.16 informs us that the church is now the Israel of God. Therefore, the Orthodox Presbyterian Church holds that the political geographical entity known as Israel is not significant in and of itself. We pray for the blood descendants of Abraham, the Jews, that they might also believe in Jesus, see Romans 9-10, through but our position would would be that the present day nation of Israel is no more significant than any other nation. On marriage, the OPC says, marriage is to be between one man and one woman. The Bible calls homosexuality sin, Romans 1, 26 through 27. There is a divinely imposed structure to marriage. Each partner has a distinctive role. The husband is the head in the marriage unit and the wife is the helper placed under her husband. The OPC position on divorce and remarriage is described in chapter 24 of the Westminster Confession, which says, adultery or fornication committed after a contract being detected before marriage giveth just occasion to the innocent party to dissolve that contract. In the case of adultery after marriage, it is lawful for the innocent party to sue at a divorce, and after the divorce to marry another as if the offending party were dead. Although the corruption of man be such as is apt to study arguments unduly to put asunder those whom God hath joined together in marriage, yet nothing but adultery or such willful desertion as can no way be remedied by the church or civil magistrate is cause sufficient of dissolving the bond of marriage, wherein a public and order orderly course of proceeding is to be observed, and the persons concerned in it not left to their own wills and discretion in their own case. On abortion, the OPC says, The 1971 Assembly, two years before the infamous Roe v. Wade decision of the U.S. Supreme Court, denounced the practice of voluntary abortion except possibly for the purpose of saving the mother's life. Worship in the OPC is given certain guidelines in the Directory for Public Worship. There should be a call to worship, public reading of God's Word, preaching, a benediction, and so forth. The Church's Directory for Public Worship states, In public worship, God's people draw near to their God unitedly as His covenant people, the body of Christ. For this reason, the covenant children should be present so far as possible as well as adults. Because God makes His covenant with believers and their children, 
families should be taught and encouraged to sit together as families. It also states that it is appropriate that worshipers at times respond with brief spoken or sung expressions of praise or affirmation such as hallelujah or amen. Another thing stated in the directory for public worship regards the arrangement of the worship assembly space. Because the pulpit, baptismal font, and communion table facilitate the part of worship which is performed on behalf of God, it is fitting that they be positioned so as to draw the focus of the congregation upon the word and sacraments, and that they be easily accessible and visible to the entire congregation throughout the worship service. Because the word is primary and the sacraments serve to seal the word, it is fitting that the pulpit be in the position of prominence. Not anyone can lead in public worship. The directory says, Public worship is ordinarily to be conducted by those who have been ordained to represent the Lord Jesus Christ in the administration of his word and sacraments. The pastor of the church is ordinarily responsible to plan and conduct public worship. Others who may lead include, under some circumstances, people licensed by a presbytery to preach, ruling elders, or men being prepared for ministry. In a Q&A response on the regulative principle of worship, it is stated, We allow for uninspired hymns and songs as long as their texts agree with the scriptures, which same rule we would apply to extemporaneous prayers and to sermons. Even among our churches, there is some variation in the understanding or interpretation and implementation of the regulative principle. But I am quite confident you would not find any of our congregations substituting drama, films, or dialogues for the preaching of the word, inventing unbiblical sacraments and ceremonies, using ritual incense, candles, crossings, depictions of deity, etc. The Directory for Public Worship recommends that the congregation sing metrical or other musical settings of psalms and hymns of praise. It also recommends as fitting that the congregation confess its common faith using creeds, such as the Apostles or Nicene Creed. A Q&A states, What it all boils down to is the exercise of judgment on what is and what is not true to scripture, as to words, and what is appropriate for the worship of God, as to music. The session should provide the guidelines of what music is appropriate for worship. If in doubt as to the suitability of certain musical renditions, the session may be asked to give its approval. In a Q&A response, it is said, We do not believe it is sinful to drink alcoholic beverages, while we do believe that the Bible calls drunkenness a sin. As to drinking, we respect the consciences of those who reject drinking as a Christian liberty, but disagree in calling drinking itself a sin. The Directory for Public Worship says it is the duty of the pastor, since he is to proclaim to the people the whole counsel of God, to cultivate biblical stewardship and the grace of liberal giving in the members of the church. He should remind them of the admonition in Scripture that everyone is to give as the Lord has prospered him, of the assurance of the Scripture that God loves a cheerful giver, and of the blessed example of the Lord Jesus Christ, who, though he was rich, became poor, in order that poor sinners through his poverty might become rich. An article on the OPC website says, The tithe, 10% of one's income and all Offerings, gifts above and beyond the tithe, are a response of thanks for God's good gifts to us. Tithes and offerings also show our commitment to the kingdom of God. The OPC says that it is the duty of everyone to remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy, and that the first day of the week is the Christian Sabbath. A Q&A says, Ordinarily, if a session calls two meetings each Lord's Day, the members are under obligation to not forsake the gathering. The booklet, What is the OPC, says, The 1977 Assembly upheld the discipline of a minister who was found guilty of violating the Sabbath ordinance by participating in an organized sport on the Lord's Day. That being said, some churches are less strict in others in their teaching on Sabbath keeping. Although there's no official position on images of Christ in the OPC, they do state in a Q&A, neither the Committee on Christian Education nor Great Commission's publications publish materials with so-called pictures of our Lord. The reasons are very obvious. Though Jesus was man, yet he is God incarnate in human flesh. And the second commandment forbids all material representations of God in worship. Moreover, no one living knows what our Lord looked like, so we avoid all physical representations of Christ. The polity of the church is Presbyterian, of which the BCO says that it is not necessary for the existence of the church visible, but is necessary for the perfection of church order. The BCO also says there are limits on what the church can bind on the membership. It says, No church judicatory may presume to bind the conscience by making laws on the basis of its own authority. All its decisions should be founded upon the word of God. The local churches are governed by the session, which contains the pastor, ministers, and ruling elders. Local churches are grouped into districts, and all of the church members within the district forms a regional church. The regional church is governed by a presbytery. Presbyteries license and ordain ministers, and they send commissioners to the General Assembly, which is the governing body of the whole church. There are three church offices, ministers, also called teaching elders, ruling elders, and deacons. 
Titles of office and calling include evangelist, pastor, teacher, bishop, elder, and deacon. The BCO says ministers, elders, and deacons in the Orthodox Presbyterian Church are required to believe the Bible as the only infallible rule of faith and practice, to sincerely receive and adopt the confession of faith and catechisms as containing the system of doctrine taught in Scripture, and to approve of the government, discipline, and worship of this church. As stated in a Q&A, the OPC ordains only males to the offices of minister, evangelist, teacher, ruling elder, and deacon. They also state, Women may teach other women or children, but they may not teach men in any official capacity in the church. The OPC is a member of the North American Presbyterian and Reformed Council and the International Conference of Reformed Churches. There are around 325 congregations and mission works in the OPC today, in 47 U.S. states and Puerto Rico, and two provinces of Canada. The Associate Reformed Presbyterian Church, Presbyterian Church in America, and Evangelical Presbyterian Church are some of the other Presbyterian denominations described here on the Ready to Harvest channel. Subscribe for weekly videos on Christian denominations. Become a member at readytoharvest.com to watch videos without ads and to view the transcript and footnotes with links for this video to continue your own research.